Hi history lovers and welcome or welcome back to the channel where I bring you new videos every week on all aspects of the past. Today on History Calling I have another gruesome dead body story for you as those always seem to go down well with my viewers. In this case we'll be looking at the death and burial of Henry I, a man whose apparent cause of death is one of the stranger ones you'll ever hear and whose body actually managed to kill a guy. If you want to find out how though you'll have to keep watching. So put down any food you're eating, because this is going to be more gross than the video I did on Henry VIII's exploding body, and let's head back to the 12th century and to Henry I's killer corpse. If you love history and want more of it, please remember to give this video a thumbs up which really helps to promote it with the all important algorithm, and subscribe to the channel and switch on the notification bell so you never miss one of my uploads. You can also check out the links in the description box below for my social media and Patreon sites. In November 1135, Henry I, King of England and son of William the Conqueror, was about 66 or 67 years old, we aren't sure of his date of birth, and had been on the throne for 35 years. He wasn't at home in London though. Instead, he was in Normandy, which is unsurprising because at this time the kings of England also had lands in France, and specifically at his lodge at Lyon la Forêt, where he had gone in order to go hunting. On the 25th of November, however, he suddenly fell seriously ill. There is a famous legend that this illness was caused by eating a surfeit of lampreys, which is a type of fish as you see here, but when we go back to the primary sources, we discover that this detail has been somewhat embellished by later writers. The contemporary monk and chronicler William of Malmesbury reports only that, quote, engaged in hunting at Lyon, he was suddenly taken ill and that this malady, as he called it, then increased over the ensuing days. Orderic Vitalis, an English monk and historian born in Shrewsbury in 1075, but who spent most of his life living in the Norman monastery of saint evroux said that the king had been planning to go hunting the following day when he suddenly fell ill in the night. He mentions no cause of this illness, however. Another writer, William of Newburgh, wrote very simply that when his life and reign were complete, Henry, quote, slept with his fathers. Newburgh was only born at around the time that Henry died though, and so wasn't truly contemporary, though he likely had access to people who were adults in 1135 and to documents now long lost to history. Only one writer actually mentions lampreys as the king's cause of death, and that is the chronicler Henry of Huntingdon. Huntington lived between about 1088 and 1157, and was Archdeacon of Huntingtonshire and Hertfordshire. He was therefore alive and fully grown at the time King Henry died, and well placed, given his job, to receive information about the lives and deaths of the English aristocracy and royal family. His writings make it clear that he met many of the leading figures of the day, who could therefore have acted as sources of information for him, and though we don't know precisely when he wrote the section of his work which deals with the monarch's death, it obviously had to be before his own demise 22 years later and might well have been much closer to the time of King Henry's death. One reason to be cautious of his chronicle though is its moralising tone and his tendency to make up details to give the text a bit more punch, such as the invented speeches he pretended famous figures had given at crucial moments of history. With that caveat in mind, here is what he had to say about the king's death. Returning from hunting at Saint-Denis in the wood of lions, he partook of some lampreys, of which he was fond, though they always disagreed with him, and though his physician recommended him to abstain, the king would not submit to his salutary advice. According to what is written, men strive against rules and seek forbidden things. This repast bringing on ill humours and violently exciting similar symptoms caused a sudden and extreme disturbance, under which his aged frame sunk into a deathly torpor, in the reaction against which nature in her struggles produced an acute fever, while endeavouring to throw off the oppressive load. But when all power of resistance failed, this great king died on the first day of December. So what I take from this is that the king was told not to eat lampreys at all by his doctor because they always disagreed with him, but went ahead and became ill shortly afterwards with symptoms including a fever. 
There is no mention of a surfeit, meaning that there's no reason to think he ate any more than usual. But it is certainly interesting that it seems to have been known that he didn't tolerate the fish very well, even though he obviously liked them. I'm no medical doctor, so I can't tell you what the problem was, but possibly some sort of allergy, or maybe even a delicate stomach caused by something like an ulcer, might have been the reason that the fish didn't agree with him. I tend to think an allergy unlikely, as that would have been a long-standing, maybe even a lifelong problem, and I can't see him continually eating lampreys if they always made him sick, so something like an ulcer, which only became a problem in later years, seems more likely, with the king being unwilling to give up on a delicacy he'd always enjoyed. I'm sure I must have some doctors amongst my viewers though, so perhaps they can offer some additional insights into a possible cause of death in the comments below. It could be, of course, that Henry's diet had nothing to do with it. Maybe he caught a chill whilst out on the hunt. It was November after all. There is also another factor to consider. The entire lamprey story may have been invented by Huntingdon. I told you he liked to give a moralising bent to his writings, and we see that in the account just given, when he says that the king's refusal to desist from eating them was a classic case of men seeking forbidden things. He may just have taken the king's unexpected death and tried to turn it into a fable about the need to practice moderation and not be a rule breaker. On the other hand, perhaps he was just better informed than his fellow writers about the king's final days, and that is why he provides this detail when others do not. Now we come to the icky part of the video, as we learn how our medieval ancestors prepared bodies for burial, and more specifically, what they did when that body could not be buried right away, for Henry was destined to be interred in England, or rather, most of him was. Some sources are more detailed about what happened next than others. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle says only that King Henry's sons and his friends took his body and brought it to England and buried it at Reading. Orderic Vitalis, however, took the time to explain the choice of burial spot for the king by saying that Henry himself had asked to be buried there because it was there that he had, quote, founded a monastery for 200 monks. He also notes that the great lords who were with the king when he died, quote, were entreated by Hugh the Archbishop and Owen, Bishop of Evreux, not to forsake their master's corpse unless by common assent, but to conduct it to the seaside altogether in an honourable escort. He then gives us some idea of how the body was treated and of the long journey it went through from the time of the king's death to his eventual burial. Henry had died on a Sunday, and the following day, 20,000 men accompanied his corpse to Rouen, where it, quote, was received with great pomp in the Cathedral Church of St. Mary. Orderic then provides a somewhat unpleasant, but still fairly detached and clinical account of the way in which the body was embalmed. It is at least less vivid, shall we say, than some of the other descriptions I'll be reading out in a minute. He tells us that, quote, during the night, the body, which was very fat, was opened by a skilful surgeon and embalmed with sweet spices. The entrails were carried in an urn to Mondeville and deposited in the church of St. Mary du Pré, which his mother began and he finished. Some of the king's knights and household staff then travelled with the body to Cannes. At that point, though, Orderic tells us everything stopped, for they were detained there for nearly four weeks, waiting a favourable wind to put to sea. During this time, the corpse of the king was kept in the choir of the church of St. Stephen, the proto-martyr, until, after Christmas, it was embarked on board ship by monks employed in that duty and carried over to England. It was then buried with great honours by the successor to the throne, that's his nephew King Stephen, and the bishops and great men of the realm in the Abbey Church at Reading. Other sources follow broadly the same sequence of events. Robert de Monte, for instance, wrote that his body was conveyed into the city of Rouen by the archbishop and the bishops and the barons, of whom there was a large assembly, and it was opened in the church of St. Mary, and the heart and the tongue and the bowels were buried before the altar of the monastery de Pré, while the remainder of his body, after having been sprinkled with salt, was wrapped up in hides and removed to Cannes, and there placed in the monastery of St. Stephen, near the tomb of his father. 
until those who had the charge of his funeral found a favourable wind for the removal of the corpse over into England. So within twelve days of our Lord's Nativity, it was buried within the Monastery of St Mary of Reading, which he had erected from the foundations and had enriched with ornaments and possessions. Stephen, the nephew of the late king and then himself king, was present at his funeral, as was also William, the Archbishop of Canterbury, and many of the nobles of the realm. William of Malmesbury, meanwhile, said that he got his information about the death of Henry from the Archbishop of Rouen, which, if true, was certainly an excellent source, and it is from him that we get our first hints that all was not well with the body. He wrote that, The body, royally attended, and borne by the nobility in turn, was brought to Rouen, where, in a certain retired part of the principal church, it was disemboweled, lest, becoming putrid, it should offend the senses of those who approached it. The intestines were buried in the monastery of St. Mary de Pré, near the city, which, as I hear, he had honoured with no mean presence, as it had been begun by his mother. His body was kept at Caen till the season, which was then very boisterous, became more tranquil. This is a reference to the poor weather noted by other sources. If we were still in any doubts that the body had quickly deteriorated after death, the chronicle of William of Newburgh would soon disabuse us of that notion. For according to him, his body, after the extraction of the brains and intestines, was embalmed, sewed up in skins, and brought from Normandy to England, where it was interred at Reading, a monastery of which he had been the pious founder and munificent benefactor. The man, indeed, who had been hired at great expense to extract the brain became infected, as it is said, from the intolerable stench, and died. And thus, as the body of the departed Alicia reanimated the dead, this is a reference to a biblical figure, so Henry's dead body gave death to the living. Now you heard me say earlier that William of Newburgh was not a contemporary source, as he was only born in around 1135 or 1136, which is close to when Henry died. If he was the only writer who mentioned this killer corpse story, I would be more suspicious of this detail than I am. However, Henry of Huntingdon, who we've established was a contemporary and in a position to get good information about major events, also relates this anecdote and may even have been Newburgh's source. Where most others made some attempt to be delicate in their descriptions of the increasingly poor state of the corpse, however, Huntingdon didn't hold back. This is what he had to say about Henry's remains. His corpse was carried to Rouen, where his boils with his brain and eyes were deposited. The body, being slashed by knives and copiously sprinkled with salt, was sewn up in oxides to prevent the ill effluvia, which means a horrible smell, which so tainted the air as to be pestilential to the bystanders. Even the man who was hired by a large reward to sever the head with an axe and extract the brain, which was very offensive, died in consequence, although he wore a thick linen veil, so that his wages were dearly earned. He was the last of that great multitude King Henry slew. The corpse, being then carried to Caen, was deposited in the church where his father was interred, but notwithstanding the quantity of salt which had been used, and the folds of skins in which it was wrapped, so much foul matter continually exuded that it was caught in vessels placed underneath the bier, this is a frame on which a coffin was placed, in emptying which the attendants were affected with horror and faintings. Observe then, reader, how the corpse of this mighty king whose head was crowned with a diadem of precious jewels, sparkling with a brightness almost divine, who held glittering sceptres in both his hands, the rest of whose body was robed in cloth of gold, whose palate was gratified by such delicious and exquisite viands, whom all men bowed down to, all men feared, congratulated and admired, observe, I say, what horrible decay, to what a loathsome state his body was reduced. At last the royal remains were brought over to England, and interred within twelve days of Christmas in the abbey at Reading, which King Henry had founded and richly endowed. There, King Stephen, after holding his court at London during Christmas, came to meet the body of his uncle, 
and William, Archbishop of Canterbury, with many earls and great men, buried King Henry with the honours due to so great a prince. There are a few points I'd like to focus on here. First, the level of detail makes me suspect that Huntington did indeed get his information from someone who was in Normandy with King Henry and witnessed the aftermath of his death. Some of it, though, seems unlikely at best. Again, I'm not a medical doctor or an embalmer, but I don't think you'd decapitate a corpse with an axe in the way described in order to remove the brain, as it simply wouldn't be immediately accessible if you did that. I wonder if what Huntington instead means is that the crown of the head had to be removed, as might be done in a modern autopsy. Also, regarding the story that the man who did this died from the stench of the body, I find this to be an unlikely cause of death. You might be horrified and faint from what's in front of you, just as he described, and even threw up, but a bad smell alone wouldn't kill anyone, otherwise we'd hear about forensic detectives and morticians dying all the time. I imagine the man concerned died from some other medical event, perhaps a stroke or a heart attack, and contemporaries just assumed that it had something to do with the body as they didn't know any better. Finally, I think we have an excellent example here of why keeping bodies unburied for a month, because it was the 3rd of January before Henry was finally laid to rest, was an ill-advised and deeply unpleasant thing to do, especially without a sealed lead coffin. Though Orderick said that the surgeon who attended the body was skilled, he was either mistaken, lying, or else the preservation techniques employed, from evisceration to being salted and wrapped in hides, simply weren't sophisticated enough to do the job. We can only imagine that it was with great relief that Henry's family and friends were finally able to complete their gruesome task and put his decomposed body in its grave. Most sources, as you've seen, provide quite scant information about his actual funeral, but the English monk, John of Worcester, tells us that King Stephen and many of the nobles met the body as soon as it arrived in England, and that the king was one of those who carried the bier which held his uncle on his shoulders on its way to Reading, which is different to Huntington's account, by the way, that they met up with it at the abbey. Let's all take a moment to think about how horrific that must have been if the body was still leaking through the hides, because remember, there's no mention anywhere of it being coffined. Once at the church, Worcester says, Masses were sung, many rich offerings made, alms distributed to multitudes of the poor, and the obsequies having been duly solemnized and his effigy, so not the actual body, exposed to view on a hearse, the royal corpse was deposited with the highest honours in a tomb constructed, according to custom, before the altar in the principal church. And so Henry I was finally buried, with bits of him resting in France, but most of him in the abbey at Reading, which was at that time brand new, having only been founded by the now deceased king in 1121. As with so many royal burials, though, that's not the end of the story, and Henry's mortal remains would not get to rest in peace as he must have hoped they would. Fast forward 400 years to the reign of Henry VIII, and a monastery was suddenly not the safe haven for royal remains it had once been. As the Tudor king dissolved these religious houses and plundered their wealth as part of the English Reformation, the buildings themselves were heavily damaged, no matter whose bones they could claim to house. By the 1550s, the abbey at Reading was derelict and the tombs had been vandalised. According to Reading Museum's website, Today the area of the high altar and Henry's tomb are now occupied by the buildings of the old St James's School and the car park of the former prison. So just like Richard III, we might have another king in a car park. It's sad, of course, that Henry I's remains are long since lost, but a plaque at the modern site does at least commemorate the fact that he was once buried there, which I guess is more than most people in history get to have. I hope you find this study of what happened to Henry I's body interesting and that I haven't put you off your food. A big thank you as always to my wonderful patrons and to those of you who give donations to the channel using the thanks button underneath videos. Let me know in the comments below if you think that lampreys were the cause of Henry's death, and if you'd like to learn more about his life and the dramatic effect his demise had on English politics, it literally caused a civil war, try one of these videos next, which look at the death of his only legitimate son and the attempt by his daughter, Empress Matilda, to inherit the throne. I'll be back next week with a new offering, and until then, keep learning.